Well, good morning uh, and welcome to Brownfields Basics, a webinar presented by the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJIT for the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority and Together North Jersey. Next slide. Next slide. This is the first of a three webinar series. Our second webinar, Show Me the Money, Brownfields Funding, will be held on November 12th at 11 a.m. And the third webinar will be held on November 24th, the topic of which will be the importance of partners, stakeholders, and community engagement in Brownfields redevelopment. Next slide. I'm Colette Santasiri, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJIT. And joining me today in, uh, in the webinar are Sean Broom, the Director of the Center, as well as Melissa Delinsky, Project Manager at the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center. Next slide. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items. All participants will be muted during the webinar. At any time during this webinar, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and make sure the setting is to all. We will leave some time at the end of the webinar for your questions. And um, the last thing is the webinar is being recorded and th the recording will be posted on our website, www.njit.edu slash njbrownfields. Next slide. So let's start our brownfield space with some definitions. The US Environmental Protection Agency, otherwise known as EPA, defines a brownfield as a property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Similarly, New Jersey law defines a brownfield as any former or current commercial or industrial site that is currently vacant or underutilized and on which there has been or there is suspected to have been a discharge of a contaminant. Some brownfield sites are easy to identify. They contain an abandoned factory or a closed gas station, but some of them are vacant tracts of land. Next slide. So why do we have so many brownfield sites? To answer that, we need to go back in time, back to the 1700s, the 1800s, early 1900s, during the Industrial Revolution. New Jersey was a prominent leader in the industrialization of the United States. Our cities and small towns alike contributed to our industrial productivity. That was a time when we created machines, chemical manufacturing, and factory systems. We had shipyards, rail yards, and mills. Chemicals spilled and seeped into the ground, and the common practice of getting rid of waste products was literally dumping them out the back door or burying them on site. This practice of waste disposal and uncontrolled spills continued until the mid uh, to late 1950s when the federal government began to promulgate laws and regulations that not only addressed the proper handling and disposal of waste, but also focused on cleaning up contaminated properties. When New Jersey experienced an economic shift and urban exodus beginning in the mid-1950s, industries, factories, warehouses, mills, and rail yards that were once part of our state's economic and historic fabric either moved out of state or became obsolete. Abandoned industrial sites as well as soil and water contamination remained. Next slide. So brownfield sites include old mills and factories, junkyards and rail yards, the byproducts of industrial legacy. Additionally, the closed gas stations and auto repair shops, former dry cleaners, and other vacant commercial properties and dump sites are also considered brownfields. It's important to point out that not all contaminated sites are brownfields, and not all brownfields are contaminated. For instance, an active gas station that experiences a leaking underground storage tank is not a brownfield. A site containing a closed auto repair facility would be considered a brownfield, but it's not necessarily contaminated. Next slide. Environmental justice and brownfields go hand in hand. Brownfields are overwhelmingly concentrated in low income marginalized communities. Brownfields are inseparable from issues of social inequity, racial discrimination, and urban decay. Brownfields cause negative impacts to communities. They can contribute to neighborhood deterioration and the negative perception of a neighborhood. 
They can attract vandals, open dumping, and other illegal or unwanted activity. They can degrade soil, water, and air quality and potentially cause public health issues. They can lower property values, reduce employment opportunities, lead to a loss of tax revenue, and limited economic growth. But brownfield sites have some advantages. Next slide. Many are located along waterways and rail lines and in dam dams, giving them a locational advantage for redevelopment. And many already have existing infrastructure, such as utility and sewer lines. Next slide. And most of all, a brownfield holds the potential for being transformed into a community asset. New Jersey has always been a state of immense opportunities. And while these industrial legacy and commercial sites plague our communities, the cleanup and redevelopment of brownfields present us with unique opportunities. Looking through the lens of the triple bottom line, that is environment, economy, and equity, cleaning up and redeveloping brownfield sites touches upon all three. Next slide. When we clean up brownfield sites, we're improving the environment. Brownfields can also be redeveloped to deal with climate change issues such as persistent flooding by creating land uses that store floodwaters, such as rain gardens, multi-use fields, and other forms of green stormwater infrastructure. Next slide. Redeveloping brownfield sites can improve a community's economic conditions by catalyzing economic development, creating jobs, increasing tax revenue, and diversifying the local economic base. Next slide. And redeveloping brownfield sites helps to improve social equity in so many different ways, including by removing health and safety hazards, removing eyesores and improving community appearances, alleviating community fears and worries, and transforming these properties into community needed uses such as affordable housing, recreation, schools, healthcare facilities, and much more. Next slide. Cleaned up and redeveloped brownfields are key ingredients to creating economically, environmentally, and socially equitable communities. There are so many different redevelopment options available for brownfield sites, and I'm going to show you a few on the next few slides. Next slide. So brownfields can be redeveloped for commercial and light industrial uses. Next slide. Residential uses. Next slide. Mixed use development. Next slide. Recreation. Next slide. Public and government uh, facilities. Next slide. Alternative energy. Next slide. Urban and urban agriculture, just to name a few. Next slide. Great. The process of identifying, assessing, cleaning up, and redeveloping brownfield sites is what the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center refers to as the brownfields blueprint. These are the essential elements to transforming your former industrial and commercial properties into community assets. Obviously, we're not going to go into details on every uh, you know, step of this process and the time we have this morning. Our intent is really to give you a basic overview and give you some tips and some things to think about as you tackle your brownfields challenges. As you'll hear later on in the webinar, the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJIT provides free guidance and assistance to help you overcome your brownfield challenges. So at any time during your journey through brownfields redevelopment, we are here to help you. Next slide. So the first step in the brownfields blueprint is the planning phase. It is widely recognized that successful brownfield redevelopment projects are based on a foundation of sound planning practices. There is a strong connection between effective early on and continued planning with redevelopment success. By focusing on some elemental planning steps, you can create a foundation that informs the redevelopment processes and encourages a more equitable and inclusive outcome. There are a number of activities that should be initiated in the planning phase that will play important roles throughout your redevelopment process. Some of these activities include identifying stakeholders, forming partnerships, and engaging your community, assessing where you're at, and developing an action plan. Next slide. 
The first of the three critical steps that I mentioned is identifying stakeholders, developing supportive partnerships, and engaging the community. Even though I'm um, saying that this is, you know, one of the first things that you do, keep in mind this is something that you should be doing throughout your entire Brownfields redevelopment process. Brownfields redevelopment is a team sport, and this step in the planning process is all about people and collaboration. Creating partnerships and collaborations help with community engagement, helps you access funding, increases your ability to tackle complex Brownfield issues, and creates avenues for future partnerships for redevelopment. Potential partners include federal and state agencies, regional, county, and local government agencies and departments, nonprofits, developers, lenders, environmental justice organizations, community groups, universities, just to name a few. And effectively engaging your community helps to ensure not only community buy-in for the ultimate redevelopment, but a redevelopment that meets the community's needs. This topic is so important to the success of Brownfields redevelopment that we're dedicating the third webinar in the series to this topic. So please join us on November 24th for a more in-depth discussion, as well as examples of how communities have effectively developed beneficial relationships, which have greatly improved their chances of smoother and successful redevelopment outcomes. Next slide. Another, another major planning is assessing where you're at. So what do I mean by that? Many communities have a tendency to become site centric. That is focusing only on the brownfield site itself and on the contamination challenges. But it's important to take a step back and first look at how that site fits within the context of the larger community. So here's what we recommend. First, assess what plans are out there and how they relate to your brownfield site. For instance, look at your municipal master plan. What does the master plan say about the area of town in which your site is located? If the master plan shows your site's area as being designated for open space, you might not want to plan for your brownfield site to be redeveloped uh, for commercial use, um, as an example. Another thing that we recommend that you do is look to see if any redevelopment plans um, are in, in place for the area in which your site lies. Um, that's going to impact what you want to do with your brownfield site. Another thing you should ask is, is your site within a vulnerable area, such as one that frequently floods? Also, look at the zoning for your site. What uses are permitted? Again, this will all influence what you ultimately redevelop your site as. Placing your brownfield site within the context of the larger community helps to inform the ultimate redevelopment vision for your site. Also, it's important to find out what action are already taken place, such as has, your brown, has a brownfield's inventory already been prepared for your municipality? Developing an inventory of your town's brownfield sites is a really important step in developing strategies for redevelopment. A brownfield inventory gives you a canvas from which to work from. It not only shows you, um, you know, information about your brownfield site as you collect that information for each of the brownfields in your community, but it also gives you the location of those sites within your town. You can then align those sites with the geographic focus areas of redevelopment in your town. So, for instance, if there's a section of your town where there it's been identified that housing is needed, look to see what brownfield sites are within that area of town and assess can these sites be redeveloped for housing. Same for if a part of your town um, there's a focus area that we need more recreation in this area of town. If you have a brownfields inventory, you can look at the brownfield sites within that focus area and say, are any of these sites suitable for recreational purposes? So it's a, a brownfields inventory is a great tool to have. The next step in the planning process is developing, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I went ahead, sorry about that. Um, the third thing is, what do you know about your site? So this is when you really look at your at your site and ask certain questions like 
who owns it? Is it publicly owned or privately owned? What are the current uses and conditions of the site? Has there already been an assessment conducted for that brownfield site? So you know that there's contamination or you know that there's not contamination. Um, is there already developer interest in that site? Those are important things to ask of each of your brownfield sites. So next slide, please. So the next step in the planning uh, process is developing an action plan. What are the next steps in the plan in the process of getting your site ultimately cleaned up and redeveloped? Carefully construction, constructing an action plan forces you to really think through all the steps need to be taken and allows you to see how each of these steps are dependent upon previous steps. So for instance, obtaining funding is critical in determining if your site is contaminated and to getting that site cleaned up. So identifying funding sources early in your planning phase is really important. Another example of the interdependency of the various steps is the development of a vision for the redeveloped site. If possible, you should know what the intended reuse of the brownfield site is going to be before you clean up the site. There are different cleanup standards depending on the end use of the site. So what I'm showing you on this slide is just some of the items that you would include in your action plan. Next slide. So why is it important to plan? It's about getting your ducks in a row and positioning for greater success with your brownfield redevelopment process. Taking the time to plan will not only help you plot out the next steps in the brownfields blueprint, it will also help you with specific items such as gaining community participation and support for your redevelopment. Uh, planning will help you write a stronger grant application when you're seeking funding because the project funders want to see that this is a real project that emanated from a planning process, not just an idea that you might have. Taking the time to plan will help strengthen the marketability of your site. It will show the, the town's commitment to potential developers and also help you attract the type of developers that you want, those interested in building projects desired by the community. Taking the time to plan helps to create inclusive and equitable outcomes. It will also provide continuity with the ultimate redevelopment, I mean, for the ultimate redevelopment of the site. So remember that elected officials come and go, but a solid vision and a solid plan can endure those changes. Next slide. Another fundamental element of, Brown, of the Brownfields Blueprint is funding. Planning for, assessing, cleaning up, and redeveloping your Brownfield sites comes with a cost. Most county and municipal governments do not have the funds to cover all of these costs. So it's really important to know where to find the funding, how to obtain it, and how to apply it to your project. There really isn't one grant that will cover everything. So you should be aware of the many different sources of funding and learn how to piece together those several sources of funding to get your entire job done. The US EPA Brownfields program provides a number of grants to the public sector and nonprofits that can be used for planning activities, determination of contamination and cleanup of sites. Other federal agencies, as well as the state of New Jersey, has funding sources to address brownfields. Since this is such an important component of successful brownfields redevelopment, we're dedicating the second webinar in this series to funding for brownfields redevelopment. So please join us on November 12th as we delve into this topic and give you examples of several different funding sources available to you. Next slide. So I'm going to turn over the program to Melissa, who will walk you through the steps of identifying and cleaning up contaminated sites. Melissa. Thanks a lot. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. So assessment and cleanup. At this point in the process, you've selected one or more brownfield sites to move forward with. Uh, next step, please. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the flow chart. Oh, sorry. Can you go back one? Sorry, this flowchart um, shows the environmental regulatory process in New Jersey. Uh, 
So this process will take you from retaining a licensed site remediation professional, more commonly known as an LSRP, uh, to obtaining the final deliverables for certifying that a cleanup is complete. Uh, so now I'm gonna break this chart down a little further and go through the steps in more detail and give you some more information on assessments and investigations. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing you should know is that um, the environmental field loves acronyms. Uh, so we've created some commonly used acronyms as a reference guide. Don't worry about this slide right now. It's a lot of information. Uh, we've put this on the website so you can go back and reference it if you had any questions. Um, and you can basically use it as a cheat sheet going forward in the environmental process. Next slide, please. Uh, so the environmental process begins with the assessment. The assessment answers the question, do any environmental issues exist on the site? At this point in the process, it's important to note that you don't have to own the site and you only have to be granted access to the site by the property owner. Um, so there's two different ways to complete the assessment phase. The federally recognized phase one environmental site assessment and the New Jersey specific preliminary assessment. So the basis of both the phase one and the preliminary assessment is to determine if there's any environmental conditions on the site. A phase one will identify recognized environmental conditions, also known as RECs, and a preliminary assessment will identify areas of concern, also known as AOCs. Both of these RECs and AOCs are indicators of past pollution or discharges at a site. And these would be things like tanks, drums, staining. During this assessment phase, no sampling is done. However, the site visit and historical research will be quite extensive and various government and historical documents and maps will all need to be reviewed in order to build a complete picture of the previous activities that took place on the site. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing that I find is confusing to some people is the difference between a phase one environmental site assessment and a preliminary assessment. Um, so phase one qualifies you for innocent purchaser liability protections under federal law, while the PA qualifies you for New Jersey's state specific innocent purchaser liability protections. So it's important to note here that in the eyes of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, a phase one does not equal a PA. So a PA follows New Jersey DP's specific technical documents and regulations and has forms associated with it. And it also has more stringent requirements for interviews and file reviews than a phase one. Um, so basically, why am I telling you this stuff? It's not to confuse you. Um, it's just to understand the difference between the two. A lot of commercial real estate transactions go with the phase one as a screening tool. So it gives them an idea of the potential liability issues at the site. And it also helps commercial lenders understand the risk tolerance for the site. Um, however, municipalities and counties have a lot of good reasons to go with the preliminary assessment instead of the phase one because the preliminary assessment gives you a more in-depth look at and protection from any environmental liabilities. And the state of New Jersey will require you to conduct a preliminary assessment to protect potential buyers from becoming responsible for pre-existing environmental issues on the site. Next slide, please. Um, so if it's determined that there are any potential for contamination based on prior usage or current conditions, during the assessment phase, the next step in the process is the investigation. So the site investigation or phase two answers the question, is there contamination on site? Again, at this point in the process, you don't have to own the site and you only have to be granted access to the site by the current property owner. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that again, a phase two and a site investigation are not the same thing in thing in the eyes of the DEP. A site investigation follows the NJDP's technical regulations for sampling frequency and laboratory analytical parameters. 
However, a phase two and a site investigation will contain much of the same information. Um, during this step, environmental samples will be collected. So those will be soil, groundwater, air, and sent to a certified laboratory for analysis. And that sampling will be based on the previously identified RECs or ASCs. Uh, so one important thing to note, uh, a difference between a phase two and insight investigation is that when LSRPs have specific um, knowledge about a discharge that has occurred on a property, they have certain reporting obligations to the DEP, meaning that they'll have to contact the DEP spill hotline to report the discharge at the site. Next slide, please. So if the analysis of the samples show contamination exists on the site above regulatory standards, then the next step is to conduct a remedial investigation. So that includes a more detailed sampling uh, to fully characterize the extent of the contamination. So that's when we're collecting more samples throughout the site, collecting deeper samples in order to understand the whole picture of what's going on here. Next slide, please. Uh, so based on the results of the remedial investigation, a remedial action work plan will be prepared and that will detail how the contamination will be addressed. So then once you've got that plan in place, the remedial action uh, can occur. And the remedial action selected will greatly depend on the type of contamination, the extent of the contamination, as well as what Colette was talking about, the proposed reuse of the property. So knowing that ultimate reuse of the property is a really important factor um, to the cleanup plan and what you decide to do. Next slide, please. Uh, so the remedial action selected can involve a lot of different things. It can be the excavation of contaminated soil. It can include capping of the site, pumping and treating contaminated groundwater, extracting soil vapor from the subsurface. And these are just some examples of remedial actions. There are other remedial methods out there um, that may be better used um, for the contamination that's present, as well as the ultimate reuse of the site. Next slide, please. Um, so once you're done with this, um, a remedial action report will be prepared and that will document the remediation that took place at the site. It will summarize all of your confirmatory sampling and analysis, and that demonstrates the effectiveness of the remedial action. Next slide, please. In some instances, the remediation is completed by using institutional and engineering controls. Um, so these can place a deed notice restriction on the property or a classified exemption area on the property or a portion of the property. So the most commonly engineered, uh, most commonly used engineering control that we see is capping. And an important thing to note here is that when you're using institutional or engineering controls, they require a permit that has to be issued by the DEP. And going forward, they have maintenance and reporting requirements that are associated with them. So that's important to know upfront how long that those will continue to go on for. Next slide, please. So the final step is the issuance of a response action outcome, or better known as an REO, which will be issued by the licensed site remediation professional, and that will memorialize the completion of the remediation. So once you're given the all clear, the site can proceed to redevelopment. And as mentioned earlier by Colette, some brownfield sites have no contamination. So the process that I laid out becomes shortened and ends after the assessment or investigation phase. And it takes a lot of time. So I can see you can see it takes time to move through this regulatory process. And it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, those can include the size of the property, the type and extent of the contamination, as well as available funding. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Colette. Thank you, Thank Melissa. You. I just wanted to mention that um, all the steps that Melissa just went through um, on the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center website, we have a lot more details on each of those steps. And we also have infographics that explain each of those steps um, in the New Jersey regulatory process. So 
I encourage you to, to check that out on, on the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center website. So New Jersey has some great resources to help you navigate um, you know, your Brownfields redevelopment journey. I like to refer to the major resources as three legs of the Brownfields redevelopment stool that supports New Jersey communities. I especially want to give a shout out to the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, who has created a Brownfields program and who has generously supported the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center, as well as the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. New Jersey DEP has also has great resources, um, especially its Brownfields staff who, um, you know, who work closely with, with municipalities on helping them um, you know, through the regulatory process and to understand all of the different steps to getting these sites um, cleaned up. So um, we we are thrilled to be partners with New Jersey EDA and New Jersey DEP. Next slide. So let me tell you about one of the major resources available to New Jersey's counties and municipalities, and that's the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJT. This is the first of its kind and only center that solely focuses on and serves New Jersey. It is a free resource to the state's county and local governments. Next slide. We at the New Jersey Brownfields Center view brownfield sites as opportunities uh, to transform industrial and commercial sites into community assets. But we recognize that many local governments do not have the in-house knowledge or resources, including funding, to tackle those challenges. So that's why we created New the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center to be that free resource. So the mission of the, the Brownfields Assistance Center includes um, educating and engaging communities around, around Brownfield issues. Webinars like today, um, you know, we really want to create that um, foundational knowledge about what brownfields are, what they could be transformed as uh, or into to help um, serve the community and, and the many steps to get through the process. So we have different educational forums. Uh, we provide free guidance and resources to county and municipal governments challenged with brownfields. We also develop tools and strategies and resources. We create partnerships and we provide subject matter experts to Brownfields Challenge communities. So that's really our mission uh, with the ultimate goal of getting these sites cleaned up and put back into productive reuse. Next slide. So the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center is not an academic endeavor. The center's team of professionals includes planners, engineers, environmental scientists, and social scientists who have experience helping hundreds of communities from across the country overcome their brownfield challenges. And the because we have this multidisciplinary team, we're able to come into a community and, and view these challenges from different perspectives. So we have, for instance, Melissa, who's the environmental scientist, who can look at those issues of contamination and how to navigate the regulatory system uh, or the regulatory process. But then we also have our planners and our social scientists and our community um, redevelopment uh, professionals who look at how can this site be transformed into a community asset? Where can we get the community get the funding? How do they engage um, the community? And, and all sorts of other ways that we can help. So, so this multidisciplinary team really um, brings this well-rounded perspective um, to helping communities overcome their challenges. Next slide. So, Here's how we can help and remember our assistance to municipal governments and local governments is free of charge. We have a resource center and that resource center is available to, to everybody. Um, you don't have to be a municipality or, or a county to access the resource center. Um, on our website, we have a lot of really good tools and resources. We also post 
valuable information on our social media platforms. Um, I mentioned the infographics that we have um, on the regulatory steps that's included on our, that's one of the tools that we have included on our website. So, you know, please look at our website and, um, and hopefully you can find different tools there and different resources that will help you. Next slide. A key feature of the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center is our Brownfields Help Desk. You can reach us by phone or email, and this is where our personal Brownfields assistance begins. We tailor our assistance to your particular needs. So you might have a quick question for us, like, you know, when is EPA coming out with their next round of Brownfield grants? Or you might want to know if we have a really good example of successful EPA Brownfield grant application that, that you can use as a model. Um, so give us a call or send us an email. Uh, we're here to help you uh, any way we can. We're here to answer those questions. Uh, and, and again, we're just a call or an email away. But sometimes um, your assistance needs might not be as simple as a quick question and answer, and that's fine. Uh, you might not even know what kind of assistance you need, only that you have a Brownfields challenge, and that's okay. Contact us. Through the course of a conversation, we can get an understanding of the challenges you're facing, and then we can suggest ways in which we can provide you assistance. Again, the key takeaway is uh, we're here to help you. We're a phone call or an email away. Um, you do not have to you know, fill out a, an application to get our services um, or, or wait uh, to get our assistance. Um, we, again, just call us or email. Next slide. So let me give you some examples of brownfield challenges and how we can assist you with them. So perhaps you have several brownfield sites in your community and you just don't know which ones you should focus on. Um, I had mentioned, you know, creating an, a brownfields inventory. So, so say you created that inventory and it shows that your community has, you know, 10 brownfield sites and, you know, which ones do you focus on first? Uh, which ones make the most sense? What we can do is we can create a project prioritization process for you and bring those sites through the prioritization process and then hand you back a list of ground fields in a ranked order. We did this for the city of Camden. They had about 30 brownfield sites that they wanted to um, focus on for economic redevelopment purposes. But again, they weren't sure which ones to focus on in which order. So we created a project prioritization process for them. We evaluated those 30 brownfield sites, put them through this process, and then handed back Camden a ranked list of sites. So based on the criteria that we had created with for them um, and for economic redevelopment purposes, the first uh, site on their list was the one that was determined was ready to go um, for for redevelopment because it, it was a sufficient size. The uh, the city owned the property. It was in a great location for economic redevelopment purposes. The, the site already um, was on its way to being cleaned up. So again, through our process, we identified all those parameters to make that the number one site they should focus on. So that's something that we can do for you. Um, maybe you're having trouble getting the attention of developers. We can give you some strategies on how to market your brownfield site. And this is really important in communities where the real estate market is not that hot and you know you might have trouble um, getting the attention of developers. So again, we can give you some strategies. Uh, maybe you lack the funding to undertake the assessment and the cleanup of the site. We can give you guidance on the many different sources of funding available. And again, we're going to that in our second webinar, but even if you tune into that webinar and you still have questions on funding sources, give us a call. Another way that we can help you is um, maybe your town is seeking certifications from Sustainable Jersey. One of the actions um, deals with brownfield sites. Um, and some of the 
activities that you can do under those actions include uh, creating a brownfields inventory and prioritizing your site and marketing your site and conducting assessments and cleanups. You may not be familiar with all of those activities. We can walk you through that. And in some instances, we can actually help you do some of those activities. Uh, another example is, you know, maybe you're new to brownfields and you just don't know where to start or how to proceed. That's okay. We'll sit down with you and create a roadmap that gives you step-by-step -step instructions on all the things that you'll need to do to get your brownfield sites assessed, cleaned up, and redeveloped. And then we can help you navigate those steps. So those are just some examples. Again, we tailor our assistance to your needs. So next slide. We wanted to make sure that we left enough time uh, in this webinar for your questions. So I'm gonna turn over the program to Sean Broom, who's the director of the Brownfields Assistance Center, who's gonna facilitate the Q&A. Sean. Great, thank you, Colette. Um, so we do have some questions. Uh, the first one is, can we explain the difference between a brownfield and a Superfund site? Okay, so um, I'll start out with that. And Melissa, if you wanna jump in. Sure, um, sure. So a Superfund site is typically a site that has an imminent threat to, um, to people, uh, you know, and, and the environment. Um, but I'd say the biggest difference is, um, has to do with laws. There is a law that covers Superfund sites. There is a law that covers Brownfield sites. And there are definitions that explain what one is and what the other one is. And when it comes to funding, there's a whole separate part of funding that deals with brownfield sites and a whole separate part of funding that deals, deals with Superfund sites. So, Melissa, what, what else? Yeah, so um, if you're not sure if there's a Superfund site, the EPA website lists all the Superfund sites. So, those Superfund sites are under the jurisdiction of the EPA. So, you're you're going to be able to find that information on their website. Um, and also, um, there's usually signs posted. There's usually pretty good um, documentation that's involved with what's happened on the site, what's going on on the site. So there's a lot more public outreach to explain to the public what's happening. Um, the, the other difference is a Superfund site has contamination. Uh, a brownfield site may not be contaminated or the contamination might be minimal and so two two very different things yeah I, i'd also add that your super fund sites are 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 listed on epa's npl or national priorities list brownfields mm -hmm. are not so the, and they are listed on there because they are, they are an eminent threat to public uh health okay so the next question we had is is there uh is there authority under federal regulations for brownfields or is it solely under state regulations? So I'm not sure what what's meant by authority, but there is. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. No, 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 no. I was just going to I think what they're saying is who who has mm -hmm. jurisdiction over brownfield sites? Is it does the I guess we're, we're the question is, is it deferred to the state? Essentially, is it? Melissa, did you want to say something? Sure. I'll, um, so if you're if you're in New Jersey, you're gonna de you're gonna defer to the New Jersey Liability Protection. If you're getting EPA funding, so you're going through an EPA grant, you're gonna you're gonna be under um, their their liability laws. But you're you're gonna need um, to talk to the DP. You're gonna need to talk to the EPA and and discuss what the best um, strategy is. So I've seen people do uh, combination phase one preliminary assessments so they can do combined reports together because a lot of that information is overlapping. So your historical maps are overlapping, the historical database searches are overlapping. And then I've also seen uh, people prepare two separate reports at the same time. So they'll do a phase one, separate from a preliminary assessment and they'll have both of those on hand both at the same time to cover themselves for both the federal and the state liability innocent uh, purchaser but but ultimately if you're going to clean up a, a mm -hmm. site in new jersey 
it's your licensed site remediation professional who's who's going to who's responsible the yeah for certifying that everything was done in accordance with new jersey regulations mm -hmm. yes and new jersey regulations I, I guess basically new jersey regulations are e at least as, as stringent as stringent or meet the epa requirements so that's why EPA yes. defers to their regulatory requirements yes. mm -hmm. so that kind of leads us into the next question a little bit melissa i guess mm -hmm. we'll probably take this as well as as a broker how can i protect myself from liability when selling a brownfield to a buyer as a okay, as a broker, how can you protect yourself? Well, um, the easy the easy thing is just to complete all your due diligence and to make sure that all of that is done before you get into, I guess, the deal of so you can mitigate your risks. You can understand what you're getting into, and then you're also qualifying for uh, innocent purchaser liability protections. Uh -huh. Okay. Next question, do you have a list of available land for sale specifically for development of warehousing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, we don't maintain any lists like that now. I mean, and DEP but, has, they have site mark. Right. Which is a list of uh, brownfield mm -hmm. sites. It's not necessarily a comment yes. of all the brownfield sites, but it is a list of, of uh, available brownfield sites. Yeah, and LoopNet is a commercial real, real estate uh, website, so there's things on there as well. Okay, next question is, could you provide a link to the environmental acronyms uh, in the chat? Those acronyms um, you can find at our New Jersey Brownfields uh, website. The list of acronyms are there. Uh, and I also want to mention, because somebody was asking uh, about having the links to the subsequent two webinars. If you go to our New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center website, which is mm -hmm. www.njit.edu slash New Jersey Brownfields. If you go to the news and events page, you'll find the links to register there. And if you go under uh, the resources or the cleanup phases under the link, mm -hmm. you can find the links to the acronyms that Melissa had put up. Okay. Melissa, are we getting all the questions yes. today? Here we go. How, okay. long, how, long does, <laughs> how long does a phase one investigation last before you have to redo the process? Uh, sure. Okay. The simple answer is one year. Um, so the ASTM standards, um, they say between 100 and 365 days. Um, so it's some, some, um, environmental consultants will say 6 months, um, for like illegal dumping and things that might have changed on the site. Um, but the ASTM standards say between 180 and 365 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. How often is the attribute data owner address, brownfield number, et cetera, updated in a New Jersey GIN website? I. Don't know the answer. I'm not 100% sure on that. I I would like to think when they get a, a new data set or some or some uh, deliverable submitted to them that they'll update that, but I'm not 100% sure. Hmm. And if we have anybody who's joining us from the DEP, if you know the answer to that question, um, you know, please put it in the chat. Alrighty, next question. Do you have to be the property owner? to initially begin the brownfield process? And the answer to that is no. You can begin the process and not be the property owner. However, when you do get to the mm -hmm. assessment phase, you at least have to have an agreement or an understanding with the property owner to have access to the site because without access, you cannot do assessment. Yeah, so the planning activities that, that I had mentioned, um, you know, conducting an inventory of your brownfield sites, you know, understanding where the funding is, um, all the, those planning activities, you don't have to own the Brownfield site to do that. I mean, that's something that, that a, a town can initiate or their environmental commission can initiate. Um, and, and that's, that information is really good, uh, is a really good tool for you as you, um, you know, look at your redevelopment. But as Sean said, you know, at some point you do need to own the site, um, and that's, you know, really when it comes to cleanup, you have to own, own the site. 
uh, but for assessment, you have to at least have permission to access the site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the question here is developers may be interested in a site location, but may not be mm -hmm. sure how to approach a community to explore Brownfield sites further. Can the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance mm -hmm. Center help in any way to make communication connection between interested developers and communities? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and that is absolutely something that we are exploring on how to make those connections. Um, you had mentioned that our team of professionals has been um, doing this this work, you know, for years across the country. We only created the New Jersey Brownfields Assent Assess Assistance Center earlier this year, so our first. Um, act was with with New Jersey EDA funding was to um, provide the free assistance to municipalities and and counties. But as we go on, we are continuing to build this center and add different functions. And one of them, um, which is top of my list, it is to create those partnerships and um, you know have like market meetups. Uh, where we can connect communities with developers. So, um, if if that's something you're interested in, you know, please contact me. But at some point, we're going to make this um, one of the focus areas of of the uh, assistance center. Okay, great questions. Yeah, useful answers. Um, that's the that's all the questions that we do have. So, Colette, I'll turn it over to you if you want to. Yeah, that, there's just one more point that I'd like to make. You know, we often say that that uh, Brownfields is Brownfields redevelopment is like any other real estate uh, redevelopment project with a twist. And, you know, and that twist has to do with the potential for contamination or the actual contamination. But you know, when we were talking about the difference between a brownfield site and a Superfund site, the whole um, I guess focus of Brownfields is really about redevelopment. It's about taking these sites and getting them back into productive use. And so a Brownfield site may not be contaminated. It's just the perception of contamination and you have to do your due diligence and, you know, find out if there's actually contamination or not, but it is, it's about real estate redevelopment. Um, so, um, you know, all the things that you would normally do when uh, redeveloping a site, you're going to do that with the brownfields. It's just you're going to have a few extra steps and you know, to navigate those extra steps. You know, that's why we're here to, to help communities understand that. Um, so I don't know, uh, Melissa or Sean, any other parting words while we still have a few few more minutes? Anything else we want to tell people um, or tips we want to give them? Um, I think, well, the thing I would say is, and just it's reiterating what you had mentioned earlier, a lot of times, you know, people, you know, if you have a, a, an issue in front of you or you have a brownfield and you just don't even know where to begin or, you know, kind of gone through the assistance that we do provide uh, and you're still not sure how that might be applicable to your project, give us a call and we can have that conversation and work through uh, what your needs are and we can help help you decide or and, and figure out where we can be plugged into this process. Um, and, and, you know, we are a free resource. And, and if you do have those kinds of challenges in front of you, um, it'd be silly not to take advantage of, of, of the free lunch, which is, <laughs> is actually what this is. So um, that would be my part words. Yeah, there's no catch. We actually are free. We're not roping you into anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Melissa, did you want to say anything else? Yeah, just um, some of the people that I talk to, they just get um, kind of stalled out. So things will move a little bit and then something will, will break down or fall apart or people will change and move out of positions and they lose that momentum. So if you feel like you have something that maybe you want to start up again or try to get going again, that would be a great thing to come to us and just maybe bounce some ideas off. Us, uh, or just talk us through what's happened and what can happen in the future. Yeah, I'm going to work on the planning, uh, the importance of planning one more time. And in the in the funding webinar that we're going to have, 
Sean is going to talk about this a lot, but I want to just mention that if you are um, planning to uh, submit a, an EPA Brownfields application, which will be next fall, their solicitation will be next fall, they just finished this year's solicitation, the time to start thinking about that and planning for that is now. We, we recommend that if at some point in the future you're thinking about Brownfields, that EPA Brownfields funding, start thinking about it now, start planning for it now, because those applications require a lot of information, a lot of data, it requires a lot of um, getting your ducks in a row as far as starting to engage your community, building those partnerships. Um, that's all things, all those things you could be doing now and, and over the next few months. So again, just really uh, hitting hard on the importance of planning when, when dealing with brownfield sites. Um, with that, uh, we are just coming on to uh, almost 12 o'clock and we said this would be an hour. So we're going to conclude. Uh, you wanna go to the next slide, Sean? And just uh, one more time, here's our uh, contact information. Again, you might not know what uh, assistance that you need and that's okay. Just give us a call and we'll talk about, you know, what's going on in your community and how we can help you. We are uh, so thankful that you joined us this morning. We hope this was helpful and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar where we talk about funding and the importance of getting that funding and um, you know being successful with that funding because this is pretty expensive uh, redeveloping brownfield sites so you need that funding so please join us for the next webinar and thanks again take care everyone thank you thank you